Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. Leo II. Pray for us. Pray for us. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, it's good to have you all here this evening. We've got a few new faces. Bill and I still have old faces, but... Speak yeah. for yourself. Oh, well, never mind. I've got an old face. Or else, am I an old soul? A very old soul. <laughs> and a very old soul is he. All right. Well, tonight, shall we... We shall talk about... The... Kingdom... Of... The... Divine... Will. <laughs> One of the hard things about this talk is that there are so many ways we can approach it because it involves so many things and we want to do a good job because it's going to involve people that you know. Lots of people that you know. It's growing. And growing. And last week, for those of you that were here, we talked about, or two weeks ago, two weeks ago. we talked about false apparitions and ways you can know apparitions are false. And this is sort of the uh, the Grand Teton of the false, false apparitions. apparitions. Um, yep. You see this box here? <laughs> this box it's like Christmas. contains, except for these, except for that stuff, contains several books. The Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will. When the Divine Will Reigns in Souls. Selections from the Book of Heaven. Millions now living will never um, die. Is, no, not exactly. Oh. The Kingdom of the Divine Will. This is like an introduction book. Three, count them, three uh, videos populated by priests. And, and Tom Faye. And Tom Faye. And a cassette. Yeah. That's not Feeney. Faye. Bill. Um, and uh, also a cassette uh, with a homily by Father John Brown and a homily by Father Thomas Celso, or Kelso, I'm not sure which. All right, and all of this was sent to me by a friend who wanted me to experience what he's experienced with this stuff. In other words, he tells me that his prayer life is greatly enhanced. In fact, he compares his prayer life now to acid trips. Oh! Which kind of amazes me because as far as I know he never dropped acid and I don't think he'd know what it was like if, but anyway he says that's what it's like he says his whole family prays now more than ever um, he goes on and on about this and most of the stuff he told me we then talked on the phone and then in person and most of the stuff he told me about the divine will is on these tapes and in these books and in fact now a third of his income comes from selling this stuff to Catholics and so he left this with me and said you know go to it Bill pray about it mm. okay so then I started reading it and uh, it didn't take very long to become alarmed at what I was reading and uh, we had a we had a <laughs> uh, session last week and sat through some of the videotapes and I got to tell you something gang <laughs> made my uh, skin crawl <laughs> I'll tell you I have never seen Mr. Coulomb look the way he looked sunk back in his chair limply raising a hand and saying stop no more I can't take it it's true you're looking at a man who sat through the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and didn't <laughs> blink <laughs> you're looking at a man who has seen more dull, stupid films than not. I even saw Werewolf with Michael Pere, and that was bad. And let me tell you, if I can't sit through a video, it's either two problems. Either it's so badly made. I mean, I mean I'm an Ed Wood fan. And I, I, that's how bad I am. This stuff, it isn't that it's poorly made. It's that the contents are so horrendous. And now, Professor Biersack 
is going to uh, favor us with some um, carefully chosen selections. Well, first of all, now first of all, anyone who's involved in the divine will will probably, there's different ways they can start presenting it, but one way is to start with a woman named Luisa Picaretta. She uh, lived in uh, the province of uh, Bari, Italy. Uh, she was born in 1865 and she died in 1947 and she spent most of her life in bed. Uh, she, uh, uh, during the time that she was confined to bed, it is said that she never had any bed sores and that she sustained herself on only the Holy Eucharist. Nothing else. Nothing else. Okay, one of her confessors is now a blessed. Blessed Luis de Francia. And, and, and she has the full support of the Archbishop of Bari. Trani, Trani. Oh. It's next to Bari, but it's not Bari. All right. Trani. While she was confined to bed for all those years, it is said that every night she would turn in effectively into a statue. That is, her bodily signs would stop and she would be rigid and uh, there was no sign of life and while and she what uh, father brown in these tapes described as an out-of-body experience yeah she went and talked to jesus or he talked to her he told her all kinds of things and then when she'd come back into her body in the morning because her confessor would order her to come back into her body she'd come back into her body she'd reanimate and then sometime during the day she'd write down her conversations with jesus and she wrote down 36 volumes of stuff that Jesus supposedly said to her. This is over a long period of time. This didn't happen in a day. Most of these volumes, by the way, were confiscated and put on the index of forbidden books. But they weren't promoted while they were on the index. Now that's interesting too. <laughs> her, her confessor, well he put the Nihil Obstat right. on them while they were on the list of forbidden books. Now I don't know if any of you remember the list of forbidden books. It was called the Index, and it was one of those things that good Pope John the Twenty-Third abolished. You see, it used to be thought, once upon a time, it was believed that the Church had some responsibility for her children's spiritual welfare, mm -hmm. and way back in those days, it was considered that if people read, they might pay attention to what they read, and so probably there are some things they shouldn't read. It's the same sort of thing, uh, those of you who have children or have had them in the past, may not have uh, permitted them, say, to read pornography. You know, that kind of thing. It's the same thing because it's a funny thing about books. If you're not well instructed in your faith, and how many of us are, it's very easy to get misled reading the wrong thing. And so the church throughout history, you know, we've, we called her Holy Mother Church. We don't say that very often anymore. But being a mother, she felt it necessary to supervise our reading, just like mommy used to do. So that's what the index was for. And you'll always hear people saying, oh, well, the index was a way of restricting freedom. Well, every, every time I hear someone say that. Everyone's free to go to hell if they want. Well, sure. And it's up to the church to let them. Now I understand. I. I always say when people give me this sort of guff, I say, great. Do you have any kids or little children around? Yeah. Let me take them to a bookstore. I've got some stuff I want them to read. And of course, I begin to describe some of the titles, you know, uh, Super Vixens Conquer the Universe and things like that. And you know what? They'll never take me up on it. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, what we have forgotten, and this does read right into what we're dealing with here, is that all of us at most times, and most of us at all times, really aren't capable of judging these things. Not, not in politics, not in religion, not in nothing. Because we base everything on what pleases us. We, we base the vast majority of our opinion, opinions at any given point on what makes us feel good. So the church from the very beginning has uh, exercised a very rigorous control like a mother, like a good parent, to be not sexist after speaking inclusive language. Uh, and this is a very, very important part of her role. This is why 
when it comes to devotions and to uh, uh, apparitions and these sorts of things. The church is always very careful, always has been very careful. It's interesting that until the abolition of the uh, position of devil's advocate in the early 80s, until that time, it was the job of that official in every cause of every saint to keep it from happening, to keep the saint from being canonized, to find anything he could to stop it from happening. And it wasn't an enviable position, by the way. No. Because uh, if you were the devil's advocate, you really had to strive. You were sworn to strive with all your might to defeat the cause. And that meant looking for real awful stuff sometimes. And the, the, the uh, again, the wonderful thing about it is that once the individual was canonized, temporarily in St. Peter's, they, they set up an altar to the, uh, to the new saint. And the, uh, <laughs> the devil's advocate would do penance in front of the altar. For, you know, for having besmirched the, uh, the uh, uh, reputation of a saint. Well, this was a wonderful system. Things have changed. Well, you know, another thing, we have something called the Code of Canon Law. And um, Is that how he became the Archbishop of Boston? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Canon Law 1832 expressly forbids an archbishop to put a uh, imprimatur on a work that is outside his jurisdiction. That is... For an imprimatur to be properly granted, it has to be put on a book that is either written in their jurisdiction or published in their jurisdiction. Now, there are two imprimaturs on Luisa Pecoretta's works, okay? Uh, one is by uh, Archbishop Joseph Leo and um, Cardinal Bernadine Ruiz, neither of which were in any way connected with the place where these were written or published. So the, you have improper imprimaturs, you have uh, a questionable nihil obstat on something that is, uh, was on the index. Uh, so there's, uh, uh, here we, we get into some really tough things here because as you all know, we want to trust our bishops and our archbishops. We want to trust the church but, as we're going to have to do tonight, to shed some light through this inky darkness, we're going to have to show that it is really up to you to learn your Catholic dogma so that you know, because you cannot trust them now. And there have been other times in history when the trust wasn't there. So this is nothing new. No. Uh, you cannot complacently sit back and say, well, 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 what does Father so-and-so say? Okay, we've, we've said that many times, but we'll say so, it a few more times. Uh, until uh, the end of the world, probably. So, well, now, well, I, what I understand now here, Professor Bersak, let me, let me ask you. So, what, what about the content of the messages? Oh, yeah, the content of the messages. Well, <laughs> okay, now, one of the things is, is the, these messages are written as if Jesus himself was speaking them. And often when divine willers refer to these things, they'll say, Jesus says. Just like that. You know, as if they're quoting the Bible. And then it's, where did he say it? Well, it's in this. It's not in the Bible. Okay. Um, oh, where to begin? Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, how about this? He says, it has been almost 6,000 years. And my humanity has sighed so much and shed so many bitter tears because I want my children to come back and live together with me. I want them around me to make them holy and happy again. I weep and weep as I call to them to come back to me. Who would not be moved to compassion over my tears and my love, which goes so far as to suffocate me, even choking me? Among sighs and agonies of love, I go about repeating, My children, where are you? Why don't you come back to your father? Why do you go away from me? Why do you want to wander about poor and full of so many miseries? And since you do not come back to me, I come in search of you because I can no longer contain the love that consumes me. And I am bringing you the great gift of my will. Oh, I beg you, I plead with you. Be moved to compassion for my so many tears and ardent sighs. 
Heaven and earth will be smiling at you. My heavenly mama will be sure to be a mother and queen to you. She knows the great good that the kingdom of my will will bring to you. And in order to satisfy my ardent desires and to stop my weeping, and because she loves you as her true children, she is traveling amongst the people of the nations, disposing and preparing them to receive the dominion of the kingdom of my divine will. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you missed this part. Before, before <laughs> the paragraph before, it has been almost 6,000 years. This is my favorite. The first paragraph just before that. Oh, how much I long for this. How I moan, how I cry, even going into delirium and weeping because I want my dearest children to gather around me and live with my very own will. Well, you know what, gang? So, so let me going into delirium. Yeah, let me get this straight. Christ is a big crybaby. Right. And mama. He's wailing and crying, and his mama is going to shovel souls at him. Just shut him up. Here, souls! It's amazing. It's, I mean, it, it's, it's blasphemous. I mean, I mean, there is no doubt that Christ yearns for us. All right. But the symbol of that yearning, and there can be no greater symbol of that yearning than the king of the universe dying on a cross. That's how he expresses his earnest love for us I mean not by weeping and crying and making heaven cringe don't forget suffocating in delirium yeah suffocating in delirium actually no no it was written in Italian of course but uh, it was translated by somebody rather it's so translated by somebody who knows Italian. <laughs> All right, now. Okay, now. Now here is, she's been around. Okay, now. This was the uh, locution uh, that was uh, dated January 29th, 1919. And here's one where it really helps to know your faith as opposed to what people want to tell you your faith is. Okay. My beloved daughter, I want you to know the order of my providence. In every 2,000 year period, I have renewed the world. In the first period, I renewed it with a flood. In the second 2,000 years, I renewed it with my coming to the earth and manifesting my humanity from which as so many channels of light, my divinity shone. And in this third period of 2,000 years, those who are good and the saints themselves have lived the fruits of my humanity, but they have enjoyed my divinity scarcely at all. Now we are at the end of the third period, and there will be a third renovation. Now let me just stop there a minute. A quick recap. We're approaching the year 2000 AD, and so there. This will we're approaching the third renovation. Okay, he created Adam and Eve, and then 2,000 years later renewed the earth by drowning it. Then 2,000 years after that renewed the earth by coming here himself, and now he will renew it again. So the world is 6,000 years old, correct? Well, 2,000 plus 2,000 plus 2,000 equals 6,000, which is why in this other quote, perhaps, you see, it all hangs together. You know, it's, like the, it it's, like, it's like the Bible. It all, no. you know, it has been almost 6,000 years. Say, so that's what the 6,000 years is all about. Okay, now, I was wondering, okay, it, it's a, perhaps a, a, a fine point, but 6,000 years, is the world 6,000 years old? Well, <clears throat> I went and dug out a Bible. Mm. What are you reacting to? <laughs> sure. Oh, you think it's precious that it's the, the an old Bible? The other side should see. Does everyone see this? Yes, it's a... Oh, like it's the one the, George Washington was sworn president on. Who cares? 
It says Holy Bible Masonic Edition. Yes. Okay. What's wrong with that? <laughs> Not a thing. Not a thing. It was good enough for George Washington. It's good enough for me. Now, here in the back of the Masonic Bible, it has the Old Testament chronology. And it says that creation occurred in the year 4004 B.C. All right? And uh, therefore, Christ was born 4,000 years, give or, you know, a few years off, but 4,000 years later, right? Okay, now, well, according to Bishop Usher. Archbishop Usher. Archbishop Usher, who was not Catholic. No. He was and, Anglican. And of a very Calvinist disposition. Okay, so at some point or other, he went through the Bible and tried to figure out how old the earth was. And, by the way, I hate to say this, but you will find this same chronology in dozens of Bibles. You'll even find it copied over into Catholic Bibles. But it is from a Protestant source. And... Um, Let's see, the other thing was the, uh, oh, the flood. Now, whether you use Usher's chronology or you use the other one we're about to mention, the flood occur occurred in the year 1656. It did not occur in the year 2000. Now, I suppose it's possible that Christ rounded to the nearest millennium. It's possible. I mean, when you're God, I guess you can... Wave Thanks. your hand and do that. <laughs> However, what happened 2,000 years after the flood? Or, another way of putting it, was Christ born in the year 4,000 or 4,004 or thereabouts? No. No? No. But the Masonic Bible says, uh, Bishop uh, Archbishop Usher said, uh, Louisa Picaretta said, well, we do, we do have another chronology we could look at, which is Roman Martyrology. Anybody ever hear of the Roman? Yeah, I know it's from Rome. Thank you very much. Roman Martyrology. What's what? It's a divine will thing? No, it's not. An Italian thing. An Italian thing. That's right. It is. And the Roman Martyrology is the book's... It's, by the way, the only liturgical book which has not yet been changed, although they're working on it. As I understand, Martin Luther King is going to be in the new one. But it is not a, uh, an infallible document, but of course it's based upon all sorts of historical documents. It's a compendium. Uh, and on the uh, 25th day of December, it says, speaking of the birth of our Lord, in the 5,000 199th year of the creation of the world from the time when God in the beginning created the heaven and the earth the 2957th year after the flood so what he is saying what the martyrology maintains is that Christ was born I'll round off I'm, I'm permitted to do that about 3000 years after the flood not 2,000. But, but, but it said, I've been waiting 6,000 years. And if you use the Catholic source, then we're approaching, or we're beyond 7,000 years. Yeah. That's 1,000 years. That's some rounding. 1,000 years is like a, a day. In the ah, day. of course. Okay. Got it. Good. <laughs> All right. So the chronology is a little bit off. Enough. But it gets better. I want to hear about the Blessed Sacrament. Oh, well, I was just going to go over to the whiteboard. Can I oh, do that? Oh, go first? to the whiteboard. My teaching instincts are popping out here. Uh, do I have to uh, shift this? Uh, oh, yeah, that, that'd be an idea. Okay, now, somebody's been <laughs> mutating my drawings here. Not me. Right. Sure. It was Charles. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Pink. Now, uh, why don't you explain this first drawing up here? All right. Well, those of you who are real old may remember a time <laughs> when you would see this symbol. It's called a trefoil in various missiles and whatnot. And it represents the Trinity. And basically... Uh, those of you who are younger 
will recognize this symbol from the cover of um, uh, Led Zeppelin's fourth album. Oh, well, very the good. It has Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> sad, sad thing is at this point, you know, the little old lady in the back says, I remember that. I don't know this missile thing. But all right. So the uh, what this symbol is intended to do is to show the concept of the Trinity as given us by the Athanasian Creed. You see Father, Son, Holy Ghost, but three co-equal, separate, but of the same nature. And I could go on and on and on, but you're familiar with that concept, I think. All right. Also, in an earlier lecture, we used this symbol to describe the Trinity, where you have a triangle with a circle in each end, and then a triangle in the center. And if you'll remember, the circle on the top represents the Father. This circle is the Son. This circle <coughs> is the Holy Ghost. And in the middle is the word God. Mm -hmm. And so, on all the outer beams, it says, is not. So the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is not the Father. But here, and yet, on all the internal beams, the word is appears, so that each person we know is God. Right. Uh, obviously, we're trying to describe the indescribable here, but it does as good as anything else you can do. I mean, the, the other one they always used was the shamrock, which St. Patrick showed us. Right, but we didn't have room for the Irish, so... No. <laughs> okay, but now we come to the new explanation of the Trinity by the divine will. Wipe that okay. smile off his face. <laughs> All right. Now, this, and this is in the videos. We watch these, this priest and a layman do these drawings and they have little stick em ups and everything. All right, so this big circle here represents the divine will. Actually, the kingdom of the divine will. All right. Now, within that kingdom, there are the three persons of God. That is, we have the Father, and we have the Son, and we have, well, they say Holy Spirit. All right. Now, the, the duties of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are assigned to them by oh, the on. divine will. So that you have the will become a sort of fourth and not subordinate, not equal, but a fourth and primary member of the Holy Trinity. Uh, so it becomes the Holy Quaternary or something. You know what this drawing actually reminds me of is when I took high school civics and they were trying to explain how our government works. And, and I know it's an impossibility too, but you, <laughs> it's a mystery. <laughs> what they told us was you have an executive branch you have a legislative branch and you have a judiciary and they are all subservient to the, the people Constitution. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. the Constitution right the Constitution is actually bigger than the president it holds more weight than any single president because it assigns the office of president all right so it is the standard against which all things American operate and when I saw this diagram put up there by the divine willers, I was saying, now wait a minute, what they're saying is there's something higher than the Trinity, which governs the Trinity, like the Constitution governs our government. So the kingdom of the divine will is this thing that assigns roles. So it assigns the role of creator to the Father. To show you, uh, I mentioned earlier, before we got started, when we were warming up the crowd, um, <laughs> I mentioned earlier that one of the off comments made by Father Brown, the Vicar General of the Archdiocese of Trani and Nazareth in uh, Apulia. Did you also tell them he talks with a Texas accent? He sure does, because he's from Texas. And how he ended up becoming Vicar General of a diocese in Italy, I never know. But he did, uh, he did say uh, sort of offhandedly, you know, pray to God so that he'll intercede. And, of course, as an offhanded statement, that's insane. But it's not that insane if you think about what must have been bubbling around in his head. Yeah, I mean, he, never, he probably would never put it that way to himself. But he thinks of the divine will as something mm -hmm. over what we call the Trinity. And it's obviously so much a part of his thinking that he makes offhanded comments based on it. There was the other priest, I think Father Celso, he also made another offhanded comment that was kind of interesting. He said, unite yourself with the nothingness the priest drops into the chalice. Oh, and I, uh, 
I didn't know if he was referring to the collection or what. <laughs> Hang on one second. But it was it was quite um, it was quite amazing. Oh, and it gets better. A whole lot's better. Oh, it. <laughs> this thing. <laughs> It's like going to Baskin Robbins and starting at one end and working to the other. And by the time you get to the other end, they've changed the flavors at the other side. Okay, now, when God created Adam, uh, he put Adam here. Inside the kingdom of the divine will. And he put Eve in here, too. Okay, so Adam and Eve are now living in the kingdom of the divine will. And get this. They have two wills. Human and divine. They have their human will, and they have the divine will. And because they have the divine will, they're in complete union with God. Yeah, may I back up for a minute? Yeah. There's one, one other thing we forgot to mention. It's very important in the order of creation. Uh, it's the Catholic teaching that creation itself was a gratuitous act on the part of God. What that means is he did it because he felt like it. Yet he didn't have to. He didn't need to. He wasn't made to do it. A gun wasn't held to his head. He did it simply. He did it simply and only because he wanted to. We have no reason. We cannot tell on this side of the grave why. It just felt like it. What the divine willsters tell us is that the three persons running around in the kingdom of the divine will were so overflowing with love that they had, let me emphasize this, had to bring forth creation in order to have something to share love with. Here it is. Overflowing and bursting with so much divine love, this this most holy trinity wanted an outlet. And a he needed a hobby. <laughs> and a place to deposit this love. But in whom should this divine love be deposited? Behold the purpose of creation. To fulfill this wish, God must re create receptacles for his divine life and love, and so was decreed the creation of man, body and soul. So, how about that? God had to do it. He was going to burst otherwise. <laughs> it's like we're... It's like being in delirium and suffocating. What are these ideas? I, I, I think, like, I feel like I've fallen into anthropomorphic theater here. If, if Adam and Eve has it, we have it. Well, no, 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 no. You're so they wrong. Give me that. I can't believe how wrong how you are. they not give that to you me? See, You'll find out. three, oh. the test. The oh. test. Oh. Reading this stuff is sort of like going through the sting, the movie, you know. <laughs> 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 These little signs, uh -huh. the test. <laughs> oh, boy. That's okay, so now you see, uh, to put the seal upon his glorious work of love, God asked of his beloved creatures a test of obedience to his will. You see, the test put, um, let's see, all while, and while all was smiles and festivity between these blessed creatures and their God, <laughs> I mean, paradise was great. Uh, smiles and festivity. There, there could not be that perfect and proper trust between children and their father without a proof on the part of Adam and Eve. The test, always capitalized, T-E-S-T. -E the test is the banner that says victory. The test puts into safety all the good that God wants to give the creature. The test puts into safety. I don't get that one. Well, you don't have to. It's from God. Maybe it's like park. Yeah. Puts into park. Oh. Okay. The test matures and disposes the soul to make great conquests. How beautiful it is to say, you have loved me and I have loved you. But without the test, one can never say this. But of whoa, course, if whoa, one whoa. has the divine will to begin with. Well, not only that, if God is omniscient, that's a big if, I'm sure. But if God is omniscient and he created you and he doesn't know what's going on inside you, well, then maybe he, that's why he's interceding for you with that higher power. I guess. That's what the higher power from AA is. Well, now we know. We've been trying to find out. So anyway, Adam was made with two wills, and Eve were made with two, vil two wills, and they were put to the test, and the te they grew, uh, this agrees that the test was that the serpent came and all that, but you see, um, uh, okay, this, this is the explanation of what happens. Uh, when Satan, the fallen angel, disguised as a fascinating serpent, told Eve an impossible story, that she could be his God. But she had the divine will. How could he possibly tell her that? 
uh, independent of the one God. Oh. That she could be as God independent of the one God. Eve failed her test, capitalized, by an elation of spirit, by vanity and pride, which blinded her prudence, for she did not pray to God to verify the serpent's story. <laughs> she did not continue. <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> What are you talking about? <laughs> this is from God. She had a direct line to God. She could call him up and say, hey, God, <laughs> would you verify the serpent's story? And he runs a credit check, you know. And Should have talked there to you are. God's secretary. <laughs> I guess this Tell isn't so much like the biblical story, is it? I mean, he just said, don't eat this stuff. And yeah. That was well, see, it. See, that in the biblical story, which again is Revelation, which actually comes from God. Remember what we said last time. Revelation stopped, ladies and gentlemen, with the death of the last apostle. End of story. Mm -hmm. Ain't no more. That's it. Now, we would not, God did not set out to accomplish our ruin. All right? That's very important that you realize this. He simply established an order which our first parents chose to violate. This wasn't, <laughs> we'll see if the kids make it. <laughs> How do I know they really love me? Maybe they're just saying that. And if that's the way the Almighty God was, what good would it be trying to verify it with him anyway? If he himself didn't know in the first place. Well, good point. But it gets better. It always gets better in this stuff. Okay, now, Eve did not continue to love God above all things. And she lost the realization of her nothingness by the pride which sprang up within. She likewise lost her crown, the gift of the divine will which cannot reign in a vessel of pride. Poor Eve. Her human will was left alone. Poor Eve. Her human will was left alone to animate her. This human will was not intended by the Creator to operate separately from the divine will. On its own, this human will is weak, vacillating, inconstant, and disordered. So Eve, with a poor, wretched human will, separated from God did take the fruit of the tree which God had commanded her not to touch. This seems to be incredible. A creature who had been given everything, even the fullness of divine life, rejected the most loving giver. However, all would not have been lost if Adam, the first to be created, had corrected Eve and led her to repentance. But alas, Adam too succumbed to pride and human respect. He too stopped loving God above all things. He preferred to please his wife rather than obey his creator. Thus the headlong plummet of our first parents from the fullness of divine life to the depths of squalor. <coughs> Yeehaw. Well, we got a lot of problems with this gang. For one thing, if they've got the divine will, it is not possible for God to will evil. His will is simply as good. I mean, it's, it's, it's just the way it is. Now, having this divine will, if they could choose to do evil, how do we know God won't do the same thing? Deities who go bad. I mean, it's madness. It's sheer madness. If they had the, the, the whole point of the story, ladies and gentlemen, is that they were humans who were told they would be like unto God. Now, if they were already like unto God, what did the serpent have to offer? If you're a millionaire, it's no point in my coming up to you and saying, hey, do what I want, I'll give you a thousand bucks. I mean, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. Of course, it means well. Oh, but it gets better. Yes. That, oh, ladies no. and gentlemen, that is our refrain this evening. Oh, but it gets better. Okay, uh, one point to be made here. What did Adam and Eve lose? Really? The divine will. I saw it on I TV. I said really. Oh. They lost sanctifying, sanctifying grace. grace. Sanctifying grace. All right. And that is what we inherited, was the loss of sanctifying grace. Now, though passing reference is made to sanctifying grace once or twice in all the literature that is in that box, the, the box. vast majority of times what is talked about is the loss of the divine will, not oh. sanctifying grace. In other words, this is describing a whole new theology. Totally new, and the divine will takes the place of sanctifying grace. That's what happens here. But there's more. And it gets better. Okay, you know, after Adam and Eve got kicked out and, and all that, 
No one else had the divine will until the Blessed Virgin Mary. She had the divine will. She was born with the divine will. See what I mean? Or see what we mean? They substitute divine will for sanctifying grace. Okay, so, of course, this presents another problem. If she had the divine will, and she already knew what God wanted and completely ascended to it, then why did Gabriel have to go to her and ask her if she would allow herself to become the mother of God. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. Oh, that was her test. Ah! She they don't say that. I'm just offering that as a possible... Well, I'll take that. Sounds good. Okay, now, the next person to have two wills... Can you guess? Ah! And here, here, at last, she coincides with the teachings of the church. Well... In a sense. Well... Because... We'll get to that. We'll get to because that. Because it's getting better. I know it gets better. But for the moment, I mean, the church does not teach that Adam and Eve had the divine will. The church does not teach that Our Lady had the divine will. It does teach that our Lord had the divine will. And a human will. Well, okay. Now, here is Jesus talking to Louisa Picaretta. The first man, by sinning, <laughs> peace child, oh, the gosh. first man, by sinning, lost the divine will. To reacquire this divine will and give it back to my creature, my humanity was necessary. Humanity which, united to the eternal word, had to sacrifice its human will in everything and under every aspect. Ah! Let me repeat that. Jesus saying is, my humanity was necessary, humanity which, united to the eternal word, had to sacrifice its human will in everything and under every aspect. Ah. My humanity did not give even one breath of life to its human will, but had it only to sacrifice it and to pay for the liberty that had so gripped man as to reject the supreme will with such ingratitude. No, 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 no. You know, I haven't mentioned this before, but there are a lot of real old heresies bound up. Their account of the creation of the world is very much like something called emanationism. The account of, um, of, the, tr of the, uh, uh, the three periods of redemption and this new dispensation is going to replace the current one. That sounds like Florianism. But, this last one is a real oldie but goodie called monothelitism. Basically, what did the monothelites teach? That to all intents and purposes, Christ had one will, the divine will. But we have another problem with this here. There are a couple of biblical stories that really don't make a lot of sense if this is true. To start with, our Lord weeping over Lazarus. Now, see, that's a wonderful story there. Why? Well, now, the Lord is God. He knows not only that he can, but he knows that he will raise Lazarus to life. So, why did he weep? He wept because his human will, his human nature, while fully knowing what he was going to do, he also knew the pains of death that Lazarus had to go through. Death isn't fun. And that was his humanity, weeping for his friend's pain. But, even more than that, the scene in the garden. How could he possibly have said, if he only had the divine will, how could he possibly have said, let this cup pass from me, if it be possible? How could he say that? How could he shed sweat blood? How could he look disappointed? Not, not my will, but, but thine, thine be done. done. Now, how is all this possible? Let me tell you something. That wonderful heresy of monothelitism, which, as Professor Virsak will tell you a bit later, that's... Uh, well, as a matter of fact, I was going to suggest we move back to our massive desk over here. Okay. <laughs> where the books are. Excuse me. Where the books are. Uh, the thing is, the thing is, ladies and gentlemen, that monothelitism, one of the, one of the big proofs against it was precisely that passage in Scripture. And let me tell you something, gang. It was a terrible, terrible heresy, monothelitism. Uh, 
I think that Professor Birzak is going to uh, come up with the decree against it. Uh, well, keep, keep yakking a minute. Hmm. Well, while he's looking for it, what's what? Monopolitism? You know, there's always someone who asks that. M-O-N-O-T-H-E-L-I-T-I-S-M. Monothelitism. It sounds like an aneurysm. But uh, yes, they were all aneurysts in those days. No, but the thing is, ladies and gentlemen, monothelitism was a terrible, terrible heresy. And, as I say, today is the feast day of St. Leo II, the Pope who finally put paid to the heresy of monothelitism. We'll be talking a little bit more about that in a minute, because, it, well, maybe more in a minute, because it um, has direct reference to the situation with the Divine Wilsters today. Now, the very notion, their notion of the need for Christ's coming completely ignores the crucifixion, the atonement of Christ. It ignores everything about that. Basically, Christ just came to bestow the, the, the divine will. And yet, notice how this parallels redemption in Catholic thought. Parallels, but it's not identical. In Catholic thought, our Lord came down from heaven in order to open the gates of heaven, in order to atone for the sin of our first parents, he had to die. He founded the church to incorporate people into his mystical body, and thence they could enter heaven. In a nutshell, that's the story. For the divine Wilsters, though, he came to bring this will, but nobody, but nobody took it. That's more of the divine will story. Nobody took advantage at all of Christ's supposed great gift of the divine will. Uh, well, what I wanted to do was uh, point out to those of you that have Denzinger, also known as the sources of Catholic dogma, if you turn to the Council of Florence, paragraph 710, it's a long paragraph that uh, it goes from half of one page to about half of another, and all it does is condemn various heresies with, that deal with Christ and his two natures and his two wills. And it is so amazing how mucked up this thing has become, which was one of the reasons the council was called, was as a clarification of this. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just to show you the, the, the flavor of it. It, that is the Holy Catholic Church, moreover anathematizes, execrates, and condemns every heresy that suggests contrary things. And first it condemns Ebion, Serinthus, Marcion, Paul of Samosta, Photinus, and all similar blasphemers who, being unable to accept the personal union of humanity with the word, denied that our Lord Jesus Christ was true God, proclaiming him pure man, who was called divine man by reason of a greater participation in divine grace, which he had merit, received by merit of a more holy life. It athematizes Manichaeus and his followers who, thinking vainly that the Son of God had assumed not a true but an ephemeral body, entirely do away with the truth of the humanity in Christ. And also Valentius, who asserts that the Son of God took nothing from the Virgin Mary but assumed a heavenly body. Uh, Arius, who asserted that the body assumed from the Virgin lacked a soul and would have the Godhead in place of a soul. Also Apoll Apollonarius. And it goes on and on with all these variant heresies that all come out of the inability to just accept what the church teaches is that Christ had two natures and because he had two natures he had two wills and the two natures and wills were united by one person now and the council of Florence isn't the only council that dealt with this I mean it's no. it's been dealt with over and over and over and over again because it keeps getting muddled and it has to keep being re-clarified it's not new it's not new theology it's simply clarifying old theology and uh, particularly hitting new eras. But I bring this up because the church went to great pains to define that Christ had two wills. And that they each of them functioned within their different spheres perfectly. They weren't, the human will was not obliterated by the divine will. As they say over and over, he was a man like us in all things except sin. All things save sin. Now, each of us here has a functioning will, I presume, or you wouldn't be able to sit upright in your chair. That being the case, if he was like us in all things save sin, 
Uh, okay. So there, there is, though, the question, as you know, in Catholic theology, uh, as opposed to uh, divine will theology, uh, the means whereby Christ's redemption is made available to people today are what? Something called the seven sacraments. sacraments. You're probably... Nope. You're wrong. Oh, oh, what is it then? I said it got better. It does. A lot better. On December 26, 1919. St. Stephen's Day. <laughs> this is taken from Louisa's writings. This is When she says I here, she means herself. She says, I was thinking to myself, how can it be that living in the will of God surpasses the sacraments themselves? How can it be? Now there's a question. When Jesus, moving within me, said, mm. quote, My daughter, why are the sacraments called sacraments? Because they are sacred and have the worth and power of conferring grace and sanctity. But these sacraments work according to the disposition of creatures. Thus, Many times these sacraments are totally unfruitful and are unable to confer the benefits they contain. My will, on the other hand, is sacred and holy and contains within itself all the virtues of all the sacraments together. Moreover, my will does not have to work to make a soul disposed to receive all the benefits that it contains because as soon as a soul is disposed to do my will, she has already disposed herself to receive all the benefits that my will contains. Finding the soul thus prepared and well disposed to receive it, even at the expense of the greatest sacrifice, my will without delay communicates with the soul and pours into her all the benefits it contains. There's, uh, no. The, uh, they have another bit here too. Um, have another bit here where he tell here it is my other sacraments however must be accompanied by uh, spe he's speaking for a while about how wonderful his will is and then he says my other sacraments however must be accompanied by much effort to dispose souls to receive their benefits and this is not always a successful effort how many times are these channels that I have left to my church abused, despised, trampled upon some even use these, these sacraments the more to dirty themselves. Others are placed in opposition to me and offend me because of the sacraments. Ah, my daughter, if you knew the enormous sacrileges that are committed in the sacrament of confession and the horrendous abuses committed in the sacrament of the Eucharist, the immense sorrow would cause you to cry together with me. Ah, yes, only the sacrament of my will can cry victory and glory. Only it is complete in its effects and, can, and being intangible cannot be offended by creatures. To enter into my will, a creature must leave his will and his passions. Only then does my will lower itself to the creature, penetrate and fuse with him, and work its marvels within him. That is why, when I speak of my will united to the will of the creature, I engage in a never-ending festival. Yeehaw! My joy is complete, and no bitterness can come between me and the soul. When it comes to the other sacraments, on the other hand, my heart swims in a sea of pain. Pain caused by man's transforming them into sources of bitterness, whereas I have given them to man as sources of grace. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a blasphemy from the pit of hell. I cannot think of anything worse. I cannot think of anything more horrific it's Jansenism, it's this, it's that, but it's worse. I, this is the kind of stuff that brought the reaction on my part that Professor Biersack referred to earlier. You can only hear so much of this guff. It's amazing. And here, you see, now you can understand, perhaps, the priest's offhanded comment, you must unite yourself with the nothingness the priest drops in the chalice. You see, these were little offhanded asides and remarks. But again, your offhanded asides and remarks are formed by what's going on in your head. Now, the next question to be proposed 
Well, you know, you're being awfully heavy-handed considering this woman had the stigmata. Oh, but she had the stigmata. This is true. Oh, but get but, this. It gets better. Oh, but see, she was very humble, you know, and like, you know, like the stigmata, like everybody knows it. You're bleeding. It's there. It's, you know, sometimes people come to see you. Like, look at Padre Pio, Teresa Neumann, tons of people. But being in the divine will, Luisa Pecoretta was very humble. And you know what the result of that humility was? She got a special gift with her stigmata. Tell them, tell them, Bill. It was invisible. <laughs> it was an invisible stigmata. I mean, that's the best kind. No muss, no fuss. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no bandages, no nothing. Just kept hey, clean. for it kept the sheets yeah. clean. For all any of us know, we may all have invisible stigmata. But it gets better. Oh, you betcha! Because the divine will the apparition also told Louisa that the saints that are already in heaven are not as great as the saints will, that will start entering heaven now that are under the divine will. And, oh, and it, now, hold on. Okay. It gets now, better. Now, see, the Old Testament saints, they didn't have the sacraments. So when the New Testament saints came into heaven, they were going, wow. <laughs> Say, man. Wow, these are greater saints than we are. Then, saints like St. Francis and St. Joseph, father of the Universal Church, well, they're looking at the divine willers as they come into heaven. And the way it's described in these videos is that like God is the sun in the middle and the divine will souls surround the sun and all the other saints, when they look to God, have to look through the radiance of these super saints that are coming into heaven through the divine will, which reminds me of a verse from Genesis. Ye, ye shall be as gods. Ooh. I mean, the brazen... Effrontery uh, is the word you want. Effrontery. I mean... The chutzpah. <laughs> I'm telling you. The thing here, ladies and gentlemen, it gets better. <laughs> because you're probably wondering how and why all of this has come to us now. Well, we've told you that Adam and Eve had the divine will and lost it. Our Lord and Our Lady had the divine will and kept it. What other person has been given the divine will? And you'll never guess who. Mama Louisa. She got the divine will. And you know what? She's willing to pass it on. It only <laughs> takes a spot. Now, the benefits of the divine will are that all you have to do to get it is ask for it. Yep. If you ask for it, you get it. Then you just start acting in it. And if you got it, you, you will have it. no more temptations. Temptations cease. Now, isn't that great? I mean, I would love to live a temptationless life. I, don't know, but see, we're talking now. And you're thinking again. See, you're thinking again. You. Stop. You see, if everyone in this room asked God for the divine will right now, you'd all just get it. It's that easy. Simple. Done. Then, everything you do from now on, like when you say, I'm washing the dishes. I'm acting in God's divine will. I'm going up the stairs in God's divine will. It's real simple this way. You know, I'm cheating on my taxes in God's there's divine win. will. Since there's no temptation, hey. There's, a, there's another old heresy here. It's called quietism. Yep. <laughs> We, we got heresies for everything. Don't worry about it. We got heresies. We, we got them. Anyway, Sisms. We got them. <laughs> Who can ask for anything <laughs> more? Okay. <laughs> Looks like we don't get anything more, so we're doing all right. Well, you see, the thing then is, gang, I don't know if you've quite caught this yet. Maybe we haven't made it clear. The thing's a crock. And it doesn't really take a lot to realize that. But it's a funny thing about this kind of stuff. And it's not just the case with the Divine Willsters. It's true with Medjugorje. It's true with Bayside. It's true with Merceda, my personal favorite. It's true with all these fake things. Once you get into it, it's very difficult really to get out. 
because your postulates, the, the way you look at the world reforms itself. Because where before you took the revelation granted the Catholic Church, if you knew it, which of course most people don't, particularly if they call themselves Catholic, you took that as your worldview. That was where you started, and from that you look around and you interpret everything. When you get into one of these things, particularly if you don't know your faith very well, your world shifts to follow whatever the seer tells you it is. You know, uh, I mentioned this last time, but uh, what's her name? Veronica Lukens, who I would believe because she was a rockette, she <laughs> said that Jesus told her that we should pray for the souls in hell. Oh. Now, guess what, gang? If you've got a minimum of knowledge about the Catholic faith, that's something that would, um, well, as uh, John Aston said when he was playing a ghost who lost his jaw, said, when a man loses his jaw, it makes him reconsider his position. <laughs> well, when Our Lady tells you, pray for the souls in hell, it's about as bad as losing your jaw. You should reconsider your position. But do you think many people were lost amongst the faithful at Bayside over that? Not many. It, well, somehow it must mean something, said some. Moore said, oh, okay. Well, like I said last time, we belong to the Catholic faith, not the Catholic high. The purpose of our religion is to give us a chance to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. It gives us a chance, a chance to get to heaven. And uh, these devotions like this that give people highs. I mean, as soon as my friend said to me the bit about now my devotional life is like LSD trips, that alarmed me perhaps more than anything else he said because that is an emotional high. That's when the endorphins kick in. And when you have experiences like that, they become like a drug. They become very hard to get out of. And then when someone comes along and says something real dull like, well, there are these dogmas, you know, or if someone comes along and points out that uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of Sister Faustina, you know, well, she lived concurrently with Luisa Picaretta, and Jesus was appearing to her, giving her the divine mercy message. Now, do you think Jesus would appear to one saint and say, or one blessed and say, uh, Here's this divine mercy, you know, and, and then at the same time appear to someone else and say, you don't need my mercy because you won't have any more temptation. Jump in my will. For that matter, at the same time, three little kids were seeing Our Lady at Fatima. Now, you know what, gang? As I hope we've tried to point out to you, this is a whole new revelation, if it's authentic. Why didn't Our Lady say anything about it at Fatima? And you see, the other good thing about the message is that if you've got this divine will, see, in the year 2000, there's going to be this big chastisement, you know? And Mama Louisa has a, uh, a wonderful way, a wonderful, wonderful way. If you take the divine will, you will not suffer at all through this, through this uh, problem. You'll come right through it. Come suck. And the thing that I like about that is it reminds me of that tabloid headline that I'll, I'll never forget at the end of my days, how to survive the end of the world. <laughs> yes, but who would want to? You know, last days of planet Krypton. The thing is, the thing is, why didn't Our Lady say anything about this at Fatima? She says, in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph and there'll be a period of peace. What about the absorption by the divine will? Why didn't she tell us? Who knew? Why did Sister Faustina, maybe, maybe she's one of those lesser saints. She's in the old mode, and she's just peddling divine mercy to those of us who aren't evolved enough. The old, the divine will. The trads. The trads. The traditional among us. Uh oh, oh the, the divine will expert is, is waving. One of the things that I think that is most seductive about the divine will that gets people into it is the fact that you become divine yourself. Sure. And you are participating with the Trinity. So you are a divinity yourself. You become God. And you can see you can from those sin. videos. You will never sin. No, you never sin. You'll never there, sin. There's no need for purgatory and there is no need for hell. And no need for the sacraments. Or the sacraments. You can see, though, I, I have to say, you know, I saw it not just with Bill. I saw the videotape 
with another fellow who knew the main presenter, Tom Fahey, ages ago, back when, when Ray Castillo was a little papoose. He knew, he knew Mr. Fahey years and years ago. Oh, well, actually, only about 10. And he saw, he saw this thing, and he looks at the guy's face, and he says, gee, he looks awful. You know, it's tough being a god when you're not made for it. And you're right, it's terribly seductive. But apart from the seduction aspect, there are really only two things, only two legs this stuff has to stand on. As I say, it doesn't square with Catholic dogma. Approved apparitions of the same period make no mention of it. It echoes condemned heresies. These are all small problems. However, it has two major defenses. One is that it has a certain amount of official approbation. Two is the personal holiness of Luisa Pecoretta. Her cause has been introduced in Rome, so now she's called the Servant of God, Luisa Pecoretta. And you can pray to servants of God, you know, privately, in hopes that they get beatified. Her confessor, who was all for her, and as was pointed out, got the Nikhil Obstat, although the stuff was on the index, so presumably it, it was, wasn't valid, but hey. Uh, he's been beatified in the past couple of years. So there's some real heavy-hitting official stuff here. And you know what? We're going to hit this heavy-hitting official stuff <laughs> after we all attack the cake. Oh, it's 9.10. Uh, no, it's 9 o'clock. So we're a bit late. I'm sorry about that. but That was my fault. I admit it. The food is in there. The drink is in there. Please enjoy it. In 10 minutes, we can meet. Now, as now, we said before the break, the, the divine will has two things going for it. They are one, authority, and two, the saintliness, the mysticism of Mama Luisa. Mama Luke. Now, the first of these questions is authority. We have been told there are some rumors that have just been presented to me that all is not as it has been presented. But nevertheless, taking everything that they've said at face value, we are told that the Archbishop of Trani and Nazareth endorses the messages. We know this to be true because he allows his vicar general to trot around the world promoting them. His predecessor, the Archbishop Emeritus, runs a center full time for the promotion of these messages. That sounds very much like archiepiscopal approbation to me. We know, or think we know, that her confessor is a blessed. Her cause has been introduced, and so she's a servant of God. So we are told. Surely, with this glittering array of authority behind it, surely, with all the priests who are for it, who are we to say anything that's wrong with it? Even though, of course, as we pointed out, it doesn't square with Catholic dogma, echoes condemned heresies, doesn't make a lot of sense, has factual problems, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it has authority. And as we know, authority, obedience, is greater than faith, right? No, <laughs> no it took a while to sink in there. <laughs> hey, what, what, what? Well, you know, actually, in, in actual practice, uh, most Catholics I know would probably, though they wouldn't assent to that verbally, act that way. You know, in other words, whatever, if, if you present them with anything like this, <coughs> they will go to their parish priest and say, well, what about this? And the parish priest will answer, and then they'll come back and says, well, Father says. You know, or in, in this case, they can say, well, an archbishop says, and a blessed says. Um, which gets us into the mur very murky waters here because it would be nice to live in a world in which we could open up any proclamation by any bishop or any archbishop or any pope or go to any church and go in and listen to any sermon and sit back and bask in the truth. That's what I do. And nothing but the truth. And <laughs> I'm in the divine will. I do that all the time. Okay, well, the problem is that we don't live in that kind of a world. And you know what? There never has been such a world. 
No, before 1963, everything was wonderful. Before Vatican II came along, everything was great. See, the way it worked in the good old days was that you had the Pope at the top. He got truth from God, mediated it directly to the bishops. The bishops, in turn, gave it to the priests who gave it to us every Sunday. Right, well... <clears throat> and that happened from the time of Christ all the way till 1965 when something happened. Well, do you remember when we were saying our opening prayers and you said... Uh, a certain saint pray for us, the saint of the day. Oh, Leo the Second. Well, yeah, because he was a pope. Okay, Leo the Second was a pope, and this today is his feast day. And those of you who have been meticulously following the liturgical year, as you have been recommended to do consistently since we started these talks. All right. Well, it, it's it's rather interesting that his feast day should fall on the day we're giving this talk. <laughs> Uh, but, you see, um, prior to his time, the church was going through, shall we say, changes. Growing pains. Problems. Okay, and guess what the biggest problem was? Uh, collections? There was a drop in them? <laughs> uh, no, those always go up in, in times of famine. Oh. Uh, no. What was it then? Well, take another guess. Okay, well, let's see. There's never been a problem with heresy before Vatican II, so... Um, 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 uh, don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me. Don't tell me. Uh, uh, vocation crisis. No, no, that's not it. Uh, uh, oh, you'll, you'll never get it. No, no, I will. Somebody wait, 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 wait. buzz a buzzer. Failure here. to enculturate. <laughs> no. Lack of ecumenism. There you go, yeah. <laughs> Triumphalism. <laughs> no, the problem was... <laughs> the problem was, how many wills did Jesus Christ have? We just heard from Mama Louisa, he had one. I know, but this was way back when. Maybe she's older than we know. And, uh, well, it's a, it's a very interesting story here. Um, let's see if I can condense it. Okay, there's a dispute in the church about how many wills Christ has. And the, the West is siding with two wills, and the East is gravitating towards one. Why? And, huh? Why? Because of the Emperor. Ah, yes. Now, the Emperor, at the time, made... He wanted the discussion to go away. He, he, isn't it funny? He wanted it to go away. So he just said, make it go away. And <laughs> emperors can do this. And the Pope agreed. Let's... Make it go away. So the Pope sent out a decree that we will not discuss this problem anymore. He silenced the Orthodox. Whoop. So, okay. <laughs> oh. Now, which Pope was that? That was Pope Honorius. Pope Honorius, that's right. Pope Honorius. Not Saint Honorius, as no, some of you no, think. No, he's not sainted. <laughs> Pope Honorius ordered the clergy not to discuss this, not to argue about it anymore. All right. So we have this gaping dogmatic question just hanging there. Now, sometimes people say, oh, well, dogma, it's not important. Why do you make such a big deal out of dogma? Well, <laughs> well, well <laughs> it defines... Because if you don't, you're a Unitarian. Yes, that's one problem. Um, and if, if you don't know your dogmas, you don't know your faith, and so we have to make sure we've got our defined dogmas down. Well, uh, so here you have a pope saying, oh, don't discuss it anymore. All right, now... Way over in Jerusalem, there's a fellow named Sophronius. And he, uh, by the way, was eventually canonized. Yes. Unlike the Pope. Unlike the Pope. Now, he wanted the question settled. And so when he appealed to Rome, he was told to shut up. Not only did he want it settled, but he was Orthodox. He didn't just want uh, an answer. He wanted the faith reaffirmed by the Pope. Because who else does one turn to to get the faith reaffirmed? Now, there's another thing going on that makes the soup even more tasty, is that the Mohammedans are attacking from the east, where Jerusalem is. All right. Now, uh, Sophronius is therefore betrayed on two fronts. His church has failed him in a dogmatic area, and the emperor fails to send troops to fight the Arabs. So, politically and dogmatically, he's getting shafted. And understand, when we say the emperor, 
the problem in, in, in explaining just how bad this really was, the situation was in, when we see the emperor, we just say, oh, well, like the emperor of Japan, president of the United Snakes, whatever. No, no, no. In, in Catholic theology, political theology, you might say, of the period, the pope and the emperor were the twin pillars upon which the world rested. The pope being supreme in uh, matters religious, the emperor supreme in matters political, because remember, they were Christian emperors by this time. And so to have both the pope and the emperor betray you, it's as if you woke up one day and the world was flat. You know, we're used to being betrayed all the time. That's, you know, if we're not betrayed, we wonder. If you woke up tomorrow morning and saw in the Times, Cardinal Mahoney affirms transubstantiation, Pope says attaboy, you'd be like, what planet is this? Is this the Twilight Zone? So, you know, you get kind of used to abuse. But this wasn't the way it was at that particular period in history. It had been different before, and as we well know, it would be different again. But at the time St. Sophronius lived, it was a little bit of a shock. So I'll, I'm going to read a little passage here. It says, Abandoned by the emperor, where the defense of the empire was at stake, disavowed by Rome as to faith, he, that is Sophronius, alone intrepidly treated with Omar as power opposed to power, and went about to die, still hoping against all hope in Rome, though thence had come a blow harder far to bear than that of the caliph, he confided to St Stephan of Dora the supreme mission which the latter thus relates. Now this is, he, he gave a, a, like a quest to Stephan of Dora. He says, in his justice, Dor uh, Stephan is saying this, in his justice, strong as a lion, um, blessed Sophronius took me, unworthy as I am, and conducted me to the sacred spot of Calvary. There he bound me by an, an indissoluble engagement in these words. Thou shalt have to render account to him who, being God, was voluntarily crucified for us according to the flesh on this very spot, when on the day of this terrible coming he will appear in glory to judge living and the dead, if thou defer or neglect the interests of his faith now in peril. Thou knowest that I cannot in the body do this thing, being hindered by the incursion of the Saracens, which our sins have deserved. Set out as soon as possible, and go from here to the farthest ends of the earth, until thou reach the apostolic sea, where the foundations of orthodox dogma are set. Go again and again, not once, not twice, but endlessly, and make known to those living there the shock that our land has sustained. Importunately, ceaselessly, oh, I'm sorry. Import, imp importunately, importunately, imp importunately ceaselessly implore and supplicate until apostolic prudence at length determine by its canonical judgment the victory over these perfidious teachings. In other words, go knock on Rome's door. Keep doing it. Don't stop. Annoy them. And you know what? He did it for 12 years. Now mind you, all the while he's doing this, he knows that his homeland has fallen under foreign occupation by the Muslims, who were not renowned for being nice. Has no idea, a good piece of the time, no doubt, what's happening to his family and his friends. But that was his mission. And the fact that he had to do it for 12 years, although Dom Garanger doesn't tell us, I'll bet his initial reception wasn't too hot. When we... Uh, there's this other thing I wanted to read here. And it's as if it's written for us today. Like much of this is. The Holy Ghost, who has guaranteed the infallible purity of the doctrine taught officially from the apostolic chair, has not pledged himself to protect in a like degree from all failure, either the virtue or the private judgment or even the administrative acts of the sovereign pontiff. I'm going to repeat that. The Holy Ghost, who has guaranteed the infallible purity of the doctrine 
taught officially from the apostolic chair, has not pledged himself to protect in a like degree from all failure, either the virtue or the private judgment, or even the administrative acts of the sovereign pontiff. In order to promote this marvelous union, which the Creator made to reign both upon earth and in heaven, our Lord, when he founded the Society of Saints upon the authentic and immutable basis of the faith of Peter, willed that to the prayers of all should be confided the charge of completing his work by obtaining for the successors of Peter such preservative graces as do not of themselves necessarily spring from the divine constitution of the church. In other words, popes can make horrendous mistakes. A pope can, as Honorius historically did, silence a debate on a dogmatic issue. A pope can allow part of the church to fall into Islamic hands. And souls are lost as a result. There's a, uh, it's amazing what they can do. There was a, um, an incident in the 50s in Australia, I won't go into details, but suffice to say, it looked, for reasons that would too, be too complex to go into, as though the Holy See were lining up alongside the Communist Party. When the leader of the Catholic lay people who were facing this problem spoke to the nuncio some years later, the, uh, and he said, well, what if, the, what if the two million Catholics in Australia, what if their souls were lost? The nuncio's reply was, well, in the long history of the church, many more than two million have been lost. So when people say, but the Pope can't make mistakes, the Pope can do no wrong, the Pope is always good, don't believe it. And this is important to realize because if that's true of the Pope, it can even be true, hard to believe as it may be, of the Archbishop of Trani, even the Archbishop Emeritus of Trani. There's a... Um, Another thing along the same line, the day before, July 2nd, the visitation, which is also kind of useful because, um, well, Dom Granger tells us, we learn from the lessons of the office formerly composed for this feast, the visitation of the Virgin Mary, which was yesterday, that the object of its institution was, as Urban conceived it, to obtain the cessation of the schism, then desolating the church. The papacy, exiled from Rome for 70 years, had barely re-entered it when hell, infuriated at a return which crossed all its plans, had taken revenge by ranging under two leaders, <clears throat> the flock of the one sheepfold. So deep was the obscurity wherewith miserable intrigues contrived to cover the authority of the legitimate shepherd, that numbers of churches in all good faith began to hesitate, and ended at last to preferring the deceptive staff of a hireling. Thicker yet was the darkness to grow till night should be so dense that for a moment the conflicting mandates of three popes would simultaneously spread through the world. Whilst the faithful, struck with stupor, would be at an utter loss to discern accurately which was the voice of Christ's true vicar. Never had the bride of the Son of God been in a more piteous situation. But Our Lady, to whom the true pontiff had turned at the first rising of the storm, did not betray the Church's confidence. During all those years whilst the unfathomable justice of the Most High let the powers of hell hold sway, she stood for the defense of Holy Church, trampling the head of the old serpent so thoroughly under her victorious foot that in spite of the terrific confusion he had stirred up, he was unable to sully the faith of the people. Their attachment was steadfast to the unity of the Holy See, whosoever might be in this uncertainty, its veritable occupant. Thus, the West, divided in fact, but in principle ever one and undivided, reunited herself spontaneously as soon as God's moment came for the return of light. Now, there are a couple of great lessons with that, and one of them hits directly on our current dis uh, discussion this evening. A lot of people turn to these sorts of things the divine will and all that because they are looking for a certainty that they think they cannot find in the magisterium of the church. They suppose that whether consciously or otherwise, because everybody knows something's wrong, even if they don't agree as to what's wrong or why, you won't find a Catholic who's got any attention at all to what to the world around him who thinks everything's peaching. See? There's, somebody disagreed with me. So, Somewhere or other, you get this distrust for the received magisterium, for the defined dogmas of the church, and for her eventual 
recovery. So what happens? Surely the second coming is at hand. Surely the divine will is going to descend and make it all make sense. Well, no. And not all the fulminations of the Archbishop of Trani, not even if the Pope himself were to step out on St. Peter's Square tomorrow and say, Luisa Pecorella, she knows. Follow the divine will. Not even then would it change the fact that it's a crock. Mere authority <coughs> cannot legitimize heresy. It can happen because that is not what authority was put in for. If the Archbishop of Trani says that, it, that Louisa Pecorella is right and she contradicts defined dogma, then the Archbishop of Trani is wrong. It doesn't matter if he sends his vicar general all over the world or to Mars with that bloody lander. <laughs> He'll still be wrong, even if the Martians accept it. That's why they came on the rocks, so they could hear about divine will. You know, I was going to, to bring another book. I forgot. A book oh, called... Want to go back and get it? No. <laughs> Not again. Radio Shack doesn't carry it. <laughs> it's called Christ Among Us. Oh, my favorite. By Father uh, Wilhelm. Former Father Wilhelm. Yeah, he left. All right, now. Pops Wilhelm. If you, open the, <laughs> if you open the front of that book, you know what you'll see? You'll see a nihil obstat. And an imprimatur. And you know what? The book is full of heresy. It was used in the Catholic school system for years. I studied with it. Me too. Oh, you mean it's not like when we went to school. No, no, not, it's not like when you went no, to No, you had the Baltimore Catechism. We, we had, had Christ, among, Christ us. among us. All right. Now, just because a book has... I remember when I used to work here at the bookstore, people would call up and they'd say, well, does it have an imprimatur? You know, and it's like, so? If it does or doesn't, what's important is what's in it. And you cannot always count on, not always, an imprimatur being assurance that everything inside the book is dogmatically sound. Not by a long shot. And you know what? In these videos, you know what Father Celso, or is it Kelso? Kelso. Kelso. He said, the first words out of his mouth are, this, uh, I'll even, I wrote them down. Da 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 Okay. Um, everything in Lucia's writings are not new revelation. They are to be found in scripture, in the scripture, and the dogmas and doctrines of the church. Oh, that's yeah. what he says. First thing, he lies. people people sit there and listen to that and say, "Oh, well, Father Kelso says it's all in line with scripture and the dogmas and doctrines of the." Church. I don't have to use my brain. I don't have to know anything about the church. Father Kelso tells me so. If God had meant for me to have a brain, he'd have taught me to think. And Father John Brown says that God intercedes for us. That's great. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. Now, here are priests, men of the cloth, wearing collars. Well, Father Brown wears a sweater. Well, anyway. And they're sitting there and telling this stuff with authority. As if it's true. With sincere looks in their faces. Very sincere. So sincere to make you sick. I mean, we are talking oozing sincerity. I'll tell you, you know, you, you speak of Christ among us. For 10 years, that thing that cost the faith of my virtually all my schoolmates, that thing bore the imprimatur of Archbishop, see, just like the Archbishop of Trani, Peter Garrity of Newark, New Jersey. And let me tell you something. Ten years later, it was lifted by order of the Pope himself. And I thought to myself, oh, so I guess during the ten years it was orthodox, but now orthodoxy's changed. I understand. You know, the funny thing was, I ran into the teacher who taught me out of that thing, Brother Lucius, and all through school I'd say, Brother, this is a lie. It's not true. And he'd say, sit down and shut up, Coulomb. It's got the imprimatur. Well, you know what? I saw him, and I came up. I was all smiles. Brother! And he said, don't bother. I know what you're going to say, Coulomb. Not a word. Just <laughs> don't say anything. 
and I, I, I understood how he felt. I shared his feelings, but he didn't share my pain, not by a long shot. Now, there's another thing we have to address here, What's and that? that is the holiness of Luisa Picaretta. Ah, yes. Ah, All right, yes. now we secret have... stigmata. <laughs> okay, well, so she has secret stigmata. Maybe, maybe not. I can't see. I don't know. How can I tell? All right. However, if we have someone... How did she know she had it? Oh, don't ask those questions. Because she she, she, Christ told her. I don't know. So, uh, so I don't know. If you, if you pull, hold her sheets up under ultraviolet light, I don't know. It's like invisible ink. You know, I you don't put know. It by the fireplace. And you, the invisible that's right. It's, okay, it's but, the emperor's new clothes. Okay, but uh, look. I'm sure that's not the one that... that grabs no. people that much it's not uh, it's the blessed sacrament yeah even though she didn't need it she sustained herself by eating only the blood and we know that many saints throughout history sustain themselves on nothing but the blessed sacrament it, so anyone that can do that must be holy and anything they say must, must therefore be, be true. true well i hate to quote from porgy and bess <laughs> then, but it ain't necessarily so. so. You know, it's funny. I was. Um, it ain't necessarily so. It ain't necessarily so. The things that you're liable, uh, uh, liable, they ain't necessarily so. Well, I said this in front of a religious brother who said, "Well, that's a horrible thing to say." I said, "Brother, you've got to remember that the character who was quoting it was the devil." Sport and life. <laughs> but speaking of the devil. There is a case. Now, now all this stuff with her out-of-body experiences, you know, and, and, and all this turning into marble and God knows what. Very exciting stuff, to be sure. And so it must come from God. Well, gang, I'm going to read you a story now. It's story time. And it's a short story, as opposed to a novel. But it nevertheless is an important point of comparison. I want you... Listen carefully to the tale. I don't say that this is an exact duplicate of Mama Luisa. I don't know. I simply read it to you to emphasize the point that just because it seems wild and saintly doesn't quite mean it is. Uh, here we are. And this book, by the way, is a book by Father Montague Summers called The Geography of Witchcraft. It's in the chapter on Spain. Madalena de la Cruz was born in 1487 of poor parents at Aguila de la Frontera. From her earliest years, her tender devotion was admired by all, and when she was but a maid of 12, she passed for a saint. A little later, miracles even were attributed to her prayers. In 1504, when scarce 17, she took the Franciscan habit in the strict house of St. Elizabeth at Cordova and in 1533 she became abbess of the community. At two successive councils in 1536 and 1539, she was re-elected. Since for nearly 40 years, there was no name so venerated throughout Cordova, and indeed all Spain as her own. Not only the poor and the citizens of uh, the town thronged to see her, but also professors, doctors, and other religious, lords and great nobles, bishops, archbishops, and cardinals themselves. The Cardinal of Seville, Don Alfonso Manriquez, Inv Inquisitor General, journeyed to Cordova expressly to converse with her, and in letters saluted her as dearest daughter in Christ, earnestly recommending himself to her prayers. The inquisitors of Cordova showed her high honor, and the holy Francisco de Quinones to be one of the most famous members of the College of Cardinals, traversed many miles solely to obtain a sight of the abbess of St. Elizabeth. Even the papal nuncio, Giovanni da Reggio, came to Cordova in great pomp on the same errand, and the Empress Isabel, remember Isabella, the lady who hocked her jewels, proudest of queens, wrote to Magdalena, addressing her as my dearest daughter, sending her portrait as a gift to the community who had it hung in the parlor, and at the birth of the Infante Felipe, I'm sorry, different Isabel, uh, afterwards Philip II, requesting the nun to bless her baby's chrism cloth and baptismal robes of white. Indeed, so many persons of high estate and widest influence flocked to Cordova to consult the abbess that it was said that her convent resembled an imperial chancery. On every side, nothing was heard but her praises. People talked loudly of her rapts, her ecstasies, her gift of prophecy. She foretold his approaching death to the Marquis de Villena when he was in robust health and seemed to have many more years of life. She announced to the general of her order, Francisco de Quinones, that he would one day receive the, the scarlet hat. And years after, in September 1528, he was created Cardinal of Santa Croce in Jerusalem. That's in Rome. 
She predicted the captivity of Francis I and his marriage with Leonor, Queen of Portugal, the sister of Charles V. Magdalena had been re-elected abbess of St. Elizabeth in 1539, but in 1542 with the Triennial Council, it was seen that a certain section of the community was opposed to her, and endeavored not without success to deprive her of the superiorship. It had been brooded and was piously believed by many that the holy nun neither ate nor drank, living only upon the Blessed Sacrament, a phenomenon which is not altogether rare in the lives of the saints. In the 8th century, St. Valborga, who had the reputation of only existing on the Eucharistic species, was placed under supervision for many days and nights, and it was seen that the report was true. In 1225, Eudy Wells, Bishop of Lincoln, 1209 to 1235, and Chancellor of England, having heard that a nun of Leicester had been sustained seven years by Holy Communion alone, refused to believe it, and deputed not one, but 15 ecclesiastics to watch her for two weeks without losing sight of her for a moment. It was only after the severe trial that the prelate declared himself amply convinced. St. Angelo Foligno remained 12 years without any nourishment save the bread of heaven. St. Catherine of Siena, 8 years. St. Lidwin of Scheidam, 28. Blessed Elizabeth of Reuter, more than 15 years. Blessed Catherine of Racunigi, 10 years. Domenica of Paradise, 20. And in recent times, Rosa Andriani, 28 years. Domenica Lazari and Louise Lateau, 14 years. And he goes on through a whole, whole, whole bunch of others. Uh, and it's, it's really amazing stuff. And then he says, not only do these abstaining saints eat nothing secretly, but often they can no longer receive food without throwing it up again immediately. They are so advanced in the paths of perfection uh, that the bread of angels is the only nourishment they desire or can sustain. It was to this extraordinary gift that Magdalena de la Cruz laid claim, and many hailed the phenomenon as a mark of unusual sanctity. However, it was discovered in the convent that she privily obtained bread and water and other refreshments. As was inevitable, she was sharply rebuked and penanced in chapter for venturing so audaciously to foster a fraud. She retaliated by diverting the rich stream of alms and bequests which was constantly flowing in upon her and which she had employed upon the house to other and exterior purposes. The new abbess, a superior of singular acuteness and perception, soon began to entertain shrewd suspicions concerning the reputed saint but she had prudently hesitated before she took action or gave any indication that she guessed all was not fair and well. It was natural, too, that many among the sisters should be troubled at the flagrant deception in which Magdalena had been discovered, and where peace had formerly reigned, mistrust made its sinuous way. Better the truth, however harsh and cruel, than a false painted show, a mockery, and a mumming. During the year 1543, Magdalena was seized with an unusual sickness, and before long it was clear that no ordinary guilt lay heavy upon her soul. A letter dated 30 January 1544, written by a sister of the same community, gives us ample details of the terrible story. The physicians who had been called in to consult upon the invalid pronounced her state to be desperate and bade her prepare for death. Thereupon her confessor presented himself to shrive as penitent and otherwise encourage her in good dispositions to receive the last sacraments. To the amazement and terror of those who were kneeling by her bed, convulsions suddenly ceased the unhappy woman. She writhed and twisted her limbs with the most indecent acrobatism, so that she could hardly be held in her place. All the while she yelled and screeched the foulest obscenities, blaspheming like a maniac, biting and snapping at those who approached, her eyes blazing with fury and foam dripping from her swelled and champing lips. The priest retired appalled at the sight. On the morrow and on the third day when he entered the room, the same fits were renewed with increasing violence. At length, realizing that here was some diabolic disorder, he exorcised the sick nun. The contortions passed to be succeeded by what seemed an attack of Correa, when she presently made a long and awful confession. She had been debauched and given over to evil from her earliest years. When she was as yet but a child of five, a strange apparition, much like an angel, visited her without awaking any alarm, and by announcing that she was destined to become a great saint, fanned the smoky fires of the sin of presumption. Anyone remember all this about you got the divine will and everything's okay? <laughs> Two years later, further apparitions encouraged her in her folly and pride and in spite of her secret malpractices, she befell, beheld the form of the crucified, to whom she were wedded, as it were, with spiritual espousals. The source of these appearances was none other than the demon. He then goes on to cite an awful lot of authorities about how that can be and why. And then he says, the appearances which visited Magdalena carefully coached her in trick rate and deception, so that she was enabled to perform seeming miracles, wonders which she herself knew were mere cousinage, and therefore must have had an origin more than suspect. She became puffed up with pride and rejoiced to hear herself everywhere saluted as a saint. When the sin of pride had wholly possessed her heart, lust soon followed. The demon showed himself to her as a handsome youth and informed her that he was one of those angels who had fallen from heaven. 
The name by which he desired to be known was Balban, and yet another spirit, Python, his comrade, also desired her. It then goes on about the various sorts of things that would occur and how she did all these fake sorts of miracles. In the end, she repented, was uh, put before an auto da fe of the Inquisition. That is to say, she was made to stand and admit her crime in public. And then she spent the rest of her years very, very penitent, penitent in a strict convent of her order, where she was allowed uh, communion only on three days a year. But what about all those people that came to see her? The papal nuncio? The, uh, didn't... Weren't they all evil? No. They were taken in. But everybody was taken in. Everybody. Now, I'm not saying that, that the case of Mama Luisa is the same. I don't know. Don't know anything about it. What I do know is that at worst case, see, if a mystic, so-called, is not from God, and you could tell that by what they say, by their messages, by their revelations, because God is not going to give them error to say. If that's the case, and there are only two possibilities of the signs and wonders that come with them. Their origins are either trickery or diabolical. Or, as in the case of Magdalena de la Cruz, some sweet combination of both. So you see, just because there are signs and wonders doesn't mean it's true. St. Uh, John of the Cross, as Professor Birsach read you last time, and who was no mean effuser of signs and wonders himself, said over and over, you can't trust the stuff. If you have an apparition, you know, you think you're seeing our Lord, don't believe it. Deny it. Flee from it. And then if it really is a, a, of God, you won't be able to escape it. But if it is, if it isn't, well then. And the other thing I have to say, and this is just a personal feeling. Um, this is a very horrible message, really. It's really awful. It looks to me, and it's distortions. It's, it's, it's things about Christ going on and on about suffocating and choking and being in delirium. It sounds like a devilish parody. I, and it's so seductive, not only by virtue of having a direct connection to God himself, can you short circuit the problem with the magisterium, but you yourself will be as God and you'll do it right here and right now. Your heaven will begin on earth. You won't be tempted, you won't sin. Well, that's great. That's jolly. That's just wonderful. And you see, it appeals to the holy ones, you know. It spreads amongst the Senecals, the Medjugorje lovers, the Gobiites. Charismatics. And you know something else my friend pointed out? The high percentage of people that he deals with in selling this stuff to them have made the total consecration of the Blessed Virgin Mary and lead a devout life. Because the devil, you see, can appear as an angel of light to deceive, if it were possible. Even the elect. You've got to go back to dogma, ladies and gentlemen. Devotion without dogma is an invitation to the devil. Because, you see, let's get something really clear here. The invisible world is quite as real, not to say more real, than what we see around us. But it operates according to certain laws. Dogma is not, oh, I got to believe it. Dogma is reality. Dogma is the way things really are. Understand, God is not triune because the Catholic Church teaches it. The Catholic Church teaches it because God is triune. When the Catholic Church has defined something, it isn't so that they can spin their wheels. They do it in the same way that scientists published the laws of thermodynamics. This is the way it is. This is the truth. This is reality. This is what God told us. That is what dogma is. If your devotional life is not firmly based in dogma, what you are doing by virtue of praying and becoming a spiritual person, it's like opening your door when you live in Harlem and saying, y'all come in. Oh yes, believe me, the case of a person who has little, little faith 
a no devotion is not quite as bad as that of someone who's terribly devout and doesn't know what they believe. The agnostic, ladies and gentlemen, does not pretend to be spiritual and doesn't tempt the devil. The devil knows that he already has him as far as he needs him. But what a wonderful thing when you've got a person who's made the total consecration to Our Lady, who says the rosary, who does all these wonderful things, and yet who isn't rooted in a strong conscious faith, in a strong dogmatic faith. What a wonderful conquest for the devil. Because you see, it's spitting in God's eye. See? Consecrated himself to your mother, did he? Well, guess what? He's mine. Now, the proof of the pudding is the way that the pride grows in these people. See, also know something else. If you study St. Louis Marie de Montfort, he's not nice. He says what schnooks we are. Over and over and over and over and over in every way. He's, he's a downer, you know. He, like, doesn't affirm. So, when you've done that, but you've got no dogmatic basis for it, it's all rooted in your feelings anyway. Along comes Louisa Picaretta, who tells you the different, the, the opposite. Who could be like unto God? You've had the steady diet of, oh, I'm a worm. And now she says, yes, you're a worm now, but you could become like God. It's brilliant. Let me tell you something else. And it's going to sound like it's off the track, but that's the way my mind works. woo -hoo! But um, I happen to be a great fan of Penn and Teller. Penn, Penn and, and Teller. Teller. Magicians. They're stage magicians. There's a great big fellow named Penn and a little guy named Teller, and Penn does all the talking, and Teller never says a word. And I've seen them perform live, and they are very funny. And one of the things they do very effectively, and they do this with a lot of tricks, they will do something on stage that just seems absolutely miraculous. But my favorite one is where they have, a, they have the stage platform there, and Penn puts a bunch of boxes over Teller. And then he takes the boxes away, and each part of the box has a part of Teller in it. So when he puts a box over here and opens the door, Teller's head's in it. And he opens up the box over here, his arm comes out. And opens up the box over here, a foot comes out. And they do all this, and then he puts it back together again, opens it up, and there's Teller back whole. And then they say, isn't this a great trick? And then, then they do this thing where they turn the whole stage around and the whole stage is now made out of clear plexiglass. And the boxes and the floor and everything are absolutely clear so you can see what they really do. And when you see what they really do, which is that as soon as they put the boxes on top of Teller, he slips through a trap door and he's spending his time scurrying around under the floor so he'll be there at the next spot where a box is put down so he jumps up and pops out his head or his leg or anything. It's all a matter of timing. And, and the point is, you see, you just didn't know how we did it. You were all fooled. And, and they do this with a bunch of other tricks as well. And, it, and it's, it's really quite funny. But the downside of them, and I've, I spoke to them personally after their show, they're atheists, adamant atheists. They hate the Bible. And you know why? because they see the miracles as tricks. And that's because they perform miracles all the time, and it's because they know how it's done. They didn't raise anybody from the dead. What did they cost about? <laughs> well, maybe they'll try. But the point is, the point is that when you see signs and wonders, you don't know how it's done. All right? It might be an angelic thing happening. It might be a divine thing happening. It might be a demonic thing happening. It might be a trick, a human trick. If you go to the Magic Castle sometime, I've seen things there that I thought were absolutely impossible. I saw a dollar bill climb up somebody's arm, go across their chest, come down the other side, fly around in circles. How did that happen? It was my dollar. It wasn't a trick dollar. It was my dollar. All right, now that's a simple example, but you see, parlor tricks have been the toys of man throughout the ages, and so have miracles. And mind you, mind you, since it's very difficult to tell the difference for us, 
since we can't really know, we have the church. And particularly, we have dogma. Now, we've tried to show you tonight the, uh, the, the mirrors and smoke around the divine will. And hopefully, you'll go out of here like anyone who sees how a trick is performed. Like Bill did. You know, you go out sort of, how do I fall for that one? Jeez. Not that you did fall for the divine will, but I mean, you know, you go out with that sort of mood. Yeah, I see how that works. Ha ha ha. You know what? If this one doesn't get you, Satan's got a hundred more. And you'll get to confront each of them as you go through life. And they'll always be the ones that might appeal the most to you. The divine will doesn't catch your fancy at all? Great. Our Lady of Irwindale is waiting. We'll see. We'll see. And unless you have this down, unless your faith life is firmly rooted in dogma, not in emotion, not in some specious authority, the Archbishop says so, not in, in emotion, not in signs and wonders, but in dogma, you're not going to be able to tell. And your faith life is going to be the spiritual equivalent of being trapped at the magic castle with no way out. Dogma tells you how the tricks are done and what isn't a trick, what's real. I mean, Montague Summers, who I read from, you notice, after going on about in a long list of her, her impostures, he gives you a long list of the real thing. A much longer list, a much more exciting list. But without that root in dogma, you can't know for beans. How would you know that the church even has a way of evaluating these things? You wouldn't. You wouldn't. But it does. So, the message for the evening, ladies and gentlemen, is not just how stupid uh, the divine will is. By analogy, it's how perilous a devotional life without a dogmatic faith is. That's the real lesson here. There's, you're begging for trouble if you don't have that dogmatic faith. A nifty little plug here is this little red pamphlet by Rick Salbato called Testing the Spirit, the Kingdom of the Divine Will. Luisa Picaretta, from God, not possible. Okay, I think it's a dollar. Oh, whatever it is. Anyway, uh, can you get them here for us? Uh, we can order some. They can I order them. I have three of them here. Yeah, it's, it's, got, it's, a, uh, it's not comprehensive, but it's a good synopsis. Sir, and what he's doing is he's redoing it all the time. He, I just talked to him today, and he's, we're, it's being updated all the time. We're giving him information, and he's, it's changed. But I have three that I'll give away if anybody wants to. Okay, and then, of course, anyone who doesn't have the sources of Catholic dogma should hang their head in shame. We wish we still had the liturgical year for sale. But, uh, well, we don't. So, I think that's about it, ladies and gentlemen. Can I just say one thing about Louisa? She, if you study her history, she had trouble, or there was a time with demonic things in her early childhood. That there was, she went through some process of getting rid of that. Now, there, see, there's an interesting point. Uh, Lynn has pointed out that Louisa Picaretta had a, some demonic obsessional problems when she was younger. By the way, the in case you'd like to know, the difference between possession and obsession is that possession is when a demon takes control, you know, <coughs> and you're spinning your head around like a top and things like that. Um, obsession is when things go on around you, you say, and things are flying and all that. And some of the saints have suffered this by itself. Demonic obsession is proof of nothing, except that the devil has some interest around that area. But it's no proof of anything, not that the person's good or bad. St. John Vianney had it, but so did a lot of evil people. There's no way of telling by itself. We go back to the church. We go back to the church as the only means of telling what these things mean.